be talking about today. So um, it gives me great pleasure this afternoon to, to introduce both of our speakers, Glennis Lloyd and Camille Trebiatowski. Glennis has recently joined the foundation and has extensive experience in English language education as a teacher, a teacher trainer, researcher, and textbook writer. And Camille has been a trainer with the foundation since 2018 um, and also holds extensive experience as an EAL coordinator, consultant, trainer, writer, and event organizer. So without further ado, I will hand them this over to them. Thank you, Sheila. Um, and welcome. And in this session, um, what we're aiming to do is um, Camille, if you can just click on the on right. the animation. So we're hoping to extend your understanding of the role of the EAL coordinator. And in particular, today we're going to focus on two areas. First of all, the induction of new arrivals. And secondly, the initial and ongoing assessment of multilingual learners. And that is in order that you will then be able to use the context of your school to build appropriate policies and practices that meet the needs of multilingual learners. So I'm going to begin by just doing a short recap um, of looking at the key guiding principles and approaches that form the foundation for work in the teaching and learning programs for students who are learning English as an additional language. And this is just going over those key concepts and guidelines that we, that we covered in the previous webinar. And hopefully this will help to create that framework for, for people who weren't, who weren't able to attend last time. So our key guiding principles, as we mentioned last time, are equality and inclusion. And first, what we would say is that these principles need to be made explicit in your policies and your practice. Um, and it is the secondly, then, it is the work of a team of researchers at Cambridge University, led by Professor Evans, that has set out a framework in which in all four areas that inclusion needs to be built. And first of all, we would point to that blue diamond, which is making sure that teachers across your school um, exhibit inclusive attitudes in their work. Second of all, that inclusion is built in across the academic programs in your school. Thirdly, that there is linguistic inclusion. In other words, that the languages that all of your learners speak and use are celebrated and built in, into the school. And finally, making sure that uh, learners who are using EAL are included in all aspects of social and sporting life of the school. Next, the key approach we would build our work on is an asset-based approach. Um, and this really has two, as two key aspects. First of all, it involves viewing multilingual learners as an asset to your school for the way in which they help to build a vibrant and diverse school community. And as many teachers and head teachers have testified for the way in which they're able to build aspirations and increase aspirations across your whole school body. And the second aspect of this approach is that it involves using learners' language resources, all the language resources that multilingual children bring to schooling as an asset and as a basis for the, for the learning programs that, uh, that you design for them. Next, the third guiding aspect is celebrating multilingualism. And this means, first of all, recognizing the key role of language in identity. For all of us, the languages that we speak and use in the different parts of our lives form a key part of, an ide of our identity. And so when those languages are recognized in learning, um, what it means is that we recognize that person, that, that student. Second of all, it means drawing on all the, the, the rich language resources that children, that children bring 
as the basis for the for the learning that they will do. For example, um, the poetry they they might like reading, the, the the songs they sing, and so on, and actually encouraging them to bring those resources into their learning. And then last, we urged you to create a clear separation between English additional language and special education needs. Um, and in fact, this is official government policy. This quote comes from the UK government's SEN code of practice, um, which states quite clearly that difficulties related solely to limitations, to limitations in English as an additional language are not a special education need. So it means identifying if, for example, like in any community, a few learners may in fact have a special education need, a learner may be dyslexic, for example, it means separating out how you assess uh, those needs and how you then address them in your support programs. So I'm going to hand over to Camille at this point, who's going to take us to the next uh, uh, point. Thank you, Glynis, uh, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's my, uh, 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 and thank you very much for attending this second part of our webinar. So yes, so uh, I'm just going to uh, make uh, one quick, very quick uh, uh, recap of uh, uh, what EL coordinators' responsibilities we were talking about uh, last time. So those of you who attended the first webinar uh, will recall that uh, seeing this slide before. Uh, so um, for the specifics of all of this, uh, I would suggest that you rewatch the uh, recording of the of the webinar uh, from last time. But uh, uh, we did talk about that the responsibilities of EEL coordinators involve uh, identifying and keeping the records of your learners, uh, monitoring their progress, tracking their attainment, uh, assessment of their language development needs, supporting other staff, uh, working with SLT so that multilingual learners benefit, uh, helping to ensure that curriculum resources reflect your school's diversity, and uh, uh, supporting parents to support their children's needs. And so last but not least, planning, teaching, and monitoring support. And uh, I used to, the, the phrase just now, last but not least, uh, because we would like to stress that these different responsibilities uh, are not listed here in order of priority. That is to say, the context of your school, your learners, the staff that you work with, all of that uh, uh, will determine your own priorities. So it's important to bear this in mind. Uh, and also, I uh, would like to advise you that it's important to delegate uh, some tasks to other staff. Uh, first of all, it will help protect your workload. And secondly, uh, uh, it will ensure that the knowledge and awareness of EAL pedagogy and those approaches to teaching uh, uh, learners who use EAL is more spread across the school. And therefore, learners are better supported in different classrooms. Like teaching assistants by teachers, pastoral team, SLT, reception staff, and in fact, any other staff. Uh, so supporting other staff in the first place can mean your ability to delegate tasks to them and in the longer run, achieve them supporting the children and yourself in this work. So uh, maybe, again, some, something to just keep in mind uh, as well. Uh, so uh, the next slide. So one thing that remains to be mentioned here before we move on is that the responsibilities or areas uh, listed on the previous slide can be applied as uh, considerations to a particular EAE level, just one aspect of your work. So we're going to uh, look at, uh, say that you would like to set up a multilingual ethos across the school. Uh, and so if that's one of your priorities, well, what do we need to consider? So we're going to look at this one by one. So. Uh, we would need to keep accurate records of learners using EEL in terms of uh, their actual languages that they speak. So that's going to be important uh, if teachers are to utilize those uh, multilingual skills. So, so then we can ask ourselves uh, a question, uh, uh, how do we keep them? Um, secondly, uh, assessing language development is not limited to the English language, but any language. And so, although of course, assessing first home languages can be difficult, where no staff speaks those languages, uh, uh, perhaps. There are ways in which this could be done. Uh, we have a home language assessment page uh, where we off offer advice on this area on our website. And that will be shared with you uh, uh, tomorrow when uh, we email you with the recording of this webinar and, and some resources as well. Uh, so that's the second. 
And then similarly, progress and attainment uh, do not need to be seen just uh, through the prism of the English language. But for instance, mathematical skills of a learner should be seen as mediated by their English language proficiency. So it's worth considering training, maybe advising teaching staff on how to distinguish between academic skills and English language proficiency. Um, and then uh, there is little substitute for supportive senior leaders if you want to establish a multilingual ethos across the school. So if senior leaders are involved, uh, uh, then it's good to ask uh, the question how to best work with them to get the best results. Um, so if, if, they are, if they are unconvinced, then uh, consider how to start getting on board. Maybe they uh, respond uh, well to research of effective practice or case of studies of effective practice, or maybe they can be convinced uh, by some teachers who already take advantage of multilingualism in their classroom. Uh, so uh, that's maybe something to think about. Uh, and then next, uh, other teachers uh, uh, might wish to support learners by taking advantage of the languages they speak, but maybe they don't know how to go about it. Uh, so maybe a training session or a guide booklet on the topic could be offered to them. Uh, and uh, similarly, for example, a reception staff might be offered some advice on how to uh, speak to parents when they come uh, to school and, uh, and how to address them, how to interact with them. Uh, uh, if, uh, if, those lang uh, if those parents also uh, have lower English language proficiency skills. Uh, and, uh, and then multilingualism is, of course, part of broader diversity approach to schooling. So if there is a member of staff tasked with ensuring broader diversity, uh, then could you work with them? Or perhaps there could be a group of teachers, uh, for example, teachers of different years meeting termly at or at other regular intervals to discuss how to set that up uh, uh, um, um, across different years. Uh, and then fin uh, finally, two last things. Uh, maybe parents can be invited to the school for a meeting about how to use their own language to support their children learning at school. Uh, or maybe there's some other way that, uh, that, uh, that you could consider uh, that uh, could help uh, them harness their multilingual skills. And finally, planning, teaching and monitoring support. So when teachers in the school plan, uh, do they consider strategies such as translanguaging, that is to, uh, to say the use of the first language for pedagogical uh, means? Um, uh, do they use those in their lesson planning? Uh, and is, is the lesson plan, uh, uh, sorry, is the, is the first language uh, part of the lesson planning process for teachers across the school? Maybe that's something to, uh, to try to uh, uh, think about. Now, obviously, uh, this in no means implies that you should be doing all of these or even the majority of these. It's simply what we are suggesting here that these are the areas you could consider in your work, but which you choose or how many, that will be uh, entirely dependent upon you and your particular context. Okay, so uh, we're now going to uh, turn to induction and I'm going to introduce you uh, to a model of induction, which you, you might choose to uh, use to, uh, to, to use in your work. And uh, we call that model PAWS, P-A-W-S. Uh, and that's because uh, it's the first letter of the four stages uh, uh, that we suggest that you might uh, wish to follow. So well, let's have a look at these. Uh, the first part of that is prepare. So this is the time before the admission of a learner to a school. And by admission, we mean the time before and including the day when parents come with their child to the school for initial meetings. Uh, with the head, but still before the learner's first day in school. So that's the first bit. A is alerts, that comes next, and it's the time between those admission meetings and before the learner's first day. Uh, so there are tasks to be done before the learner's first day, such as passing on relevant, relevant information to staff, We'll talk about this in just a few seconds. And it will be important that the alert stage constitutes a few working days before the prepare stage and the next one, which is welcome. So this is the learner's first day uh, or first days in school. And it is important that uh, uh, the learners are supported as well as possible by all and any members they encounter. And then finally, final stage is support. Uh, so after the uh, initial first days, what do we do in the next few weeks uh, to set up the learner for success and ensure that the learner is supported across the entire curriculum and in all aspects of school? So this stage will involve ongoing English and maybe not only English language assessment of the learner, 
uh, among others, uh, and we'll speak about these uh, uh, in a more detail in a few moments. Okay, so that's that's the overview of the uh, of uh, of the process. So now let's have a look uh, at uh, at this one by one. So we're going to start with prepare. So uh, here we'll wish to arrange a tour of the school for pupil and parents with L1, that's first language support. Uh, if the learner is new to English, it's likely that so, so will their parents. Uh, and so it will be important to have first language support, but even where the, uh, the, the, the adults who come to the school are more English language proficient, they will always appreciate that uh, their language is being acknowledged and valued in this manner. Um, and secondly, while the parents and the learner make their first visit to the school, it's typical practice uh, to gather information from them about uh, previous educational history of the child uh, and a specific needs, hobbies, interests, strong subjects, and any special educational needs as well. Now, this can be difficult with the uh, language barrier present. So you might consider an interpreter for such a me meeting. Uh, and those kinds of meetings tend to be conducted by an SLT member. Uh, but, uh, as I said, you might consider an interpreter, but you might not have access to such a, to such a service, or, uh, uh, or perhaps there's nobody in the school who uh, happens to speak the same language as the parents. So one very good tool is the online background collation tool from SouthGrid Learning, uh, uh, SouthGrid for Learning, and it is free. It is translated into 17 languages, and I think Ukrainian was just added to that very recently. Uh, and it helps asking parents and carers background questions in, in their own language. Uh, some languages are actually also recorded as audio in, in the first language. So it's, uh, it's certainly something to, to have a look at. Uh, uh, it could be helpful uh, during such meetings. Um, and then the information gathered from parents can be used to write up the EAL uh, learner's profile. Uh, we should just say that we are not suggesting that uh, profiles should be written for all the children. Uh, 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 consider how much time this would take and consider your workloads. Uh, you might need to only sort of uh, write profiles for uh, learners for certain stages. But on our website, you will find downloadable and free EAL profile template that you could use following the admission uh, uh, meeting. And as you can see uh, from this, uh, not everything can be completed after the meeting. For example, assessment of proficiency in English, we recommend to be carried out not before at least two weeks have passed since the first day, uh, but much of the information can be gathered uh, from that first meeting. And additionally, around this time, it's important to provide information to parents about the essential needs that they think to know, organization of the week, how the school communicates with parents, uh, children's homework, and so on. So again, where possible, if this can be translated into the parents' uh, 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 first language, that's always useful. Um, and at the very least, if that's not possible, uh, try to use a sort of more, less, for, less formal, uh, more plain English writing, because that will be more accessible. Um, as well. Um, our parental involvement page, uh, on that page, you will see uh, guidance for parents on how to help their child learn uh, within the English education system, and that's been translated into 21 languages. Again, uh, uh, things from our website are free to download. Um, so have a look at that. Um, and finally, uh, well, agree a start date and organize an initial timetable. If the learner is going into EAL induction, we need to determine how many lessons and hours uh, they will need to spend there versus mainstream subject lessons. I will speak about that in a little while myself. Uh, and any withdrawal should be time limited rather than outcome based, uh, and any language support should be linked to mainstream curriculum. And that's because those learners have this uh, uh, have this. Uh, are in this situation where they have to learn English and through English uh, at the same time. And we spoke about that uh, during the first webinar. Uh, and we are suggesting that uh, an induction should not be longer than uh, 12 weeks. Uh, and uh, these are the, the, the kind of people, they are the same icons we showed before. So it's worth considering who might be involved in uh, carrying out these, these tasks. So uh, the first icon here just shows you that it might be an SLT member, for example, that's record keeping. Uh, and that's communication with parents. So with each of these stages, it would be uh, useful to consider who you think might you might involve, if anyone, 
uh, to help you carry out these tasks. Um, okay, uh, we're going to move on to the alert stage. So firstly, once that profile has been produced, it's time to share it with relevant staff. Not all staff will deal with the child. So I think it's important not to overload teachers and other staff with information they do not need uh, uh, in an unnecessary manner. So send it only to those who actually do need it. Uh, and secondly, you can organize a party system. So uh, who, uh, 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 who will support the child from day one, meeting them at the reception, taking them to class, then to lunch, uh, uh, and offer peer-to-peer -peer support in their first days and weeks of schools. Ideally, these buddies will speak the same language uh, as, uh, as the learner, but it might not be possible always. Uh, and these learners need to also to know what is expected of them and perhaps actually not expected in that role. Uh, and this leads us to Young Interpreter Scheme, which is a suite of training resources, which um, we can use to train uh, those young people who would be buddies, uh, student translators. This role includes buddies, but it doesn't have to be limited to it. So such learners can act as translators, for example, at events such as parents' evenings and, uh, and certain other meetings. Uh, and the training program demonstrates to learners how to behave and how to uh, and how not to when interacting with others in their role as translator. So very, very useful resource, that one. Um, okay. Uh, you will need to make certain arrangements in all likelihood before the learner starts. So this involves things like, uh, uh, do they have the full uniform, uh, PE kits? Are they eligible for free school meals? Uh, is there a prayer room uh, that, uh, that they would need if they're uh, religious and observant? And finally, uh, before the learner's first day arrives, might need to plan support for each part of the day. So uh, considering what happens on that first day bit by bit, uh, from the learner's arrival in the reception, uh, what happens during break times, who takes them to the classroom and so on and so forth. Uh, and also, uh, do you need to print or prepare any resources? Uh, beforehand. Um, so that's the alert stage. And now we're at welcome stage. So here, so that's, uh, as you remember, the first uh, day of the learners in school. So ensure that when that arrival comes to school in the morning, there's somebody there to greet them. Uh, again, it's useful to work with reception staff because receptions can be very busy first thing in the morning. Uh, and have a plan what to say to the learner and potentially parents uh, when they arrive as a way of welcoming them. Uh, and uh, since we mentioned buddies, so introduce them to the buddies, they could be obviously uh, 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 in that reception as well at the same time. Um, uh, then uh, check that the learner has food and drink, not just at lunchtime, but any other breaks. It might be a good idea to allow learners who are new to English to have a quiet classroom that they could uh, sort of retreat to during breaks because being exposed to a completely new language all day will be exhausting. And so uh, such a breathing space would be quite useful uh, for them and a great relief to many learners. And uh, check if they understand what they are doing and who to ask uh, for help. Uh, many schools use communication funds, which are uh, sort of laminated cards uh, with pictures and words or them, uh, or them communicating certain messages such as, can I go to a toilet, my tummy hurts, and then uh, the learners can just put those uh, cards up and show to the teacher without the need to speak, uh, uh, which can be very, very helpful, particularly in those first uh, weeks. Again, at all times, do consider if there's, uh, there are other members of staff uh, that could help you out uh, uh, with these. And uh, we are now on the last stage, which is support. Uh, so after those first days, it's important to consider what needs to be done to ensure ongoing and robust support, uh, robust support to the learner. And so uh, we need to plan for English language support, uh, and uh, many new to English learners will be placed in intensive English language support program. As we have already said, uh, 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 this should not be longer than 12 weeks, but EL induction programs are going to include potentially survival English lessons, but it is important that all that is taught is linked to the curriculum as much as possible. So for example, uh, sentences such as, it is a boy and it is a girl, you can teach the same structure by simply replacing it with, it is a king, it is a queen, with reference to Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, and now you're in the, in the history subject 
curriculum territory. So uh, th 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 that's how it can be uh, sort of considered and, uh, and, and structured. Uh, so we always relate to uh, school subjects. Um, some resources can be helpful when thinking about what to include in the withdrawal program. So first of all, uh, uh, we have our own resources. Uh, these are our great ideas, which are 20 uh, EAL strategies and growing number of teaching resources, which you can download from our website for free. Uh, then there is uh, Learning Village, which is an interactive game-like online environment with, uh, with a dedicated app specifically designed for learners to use EAL. Uh, and that includes survival like uh, uh, survival English lessons, but all is actually linked to the to the curriculum. So very, very useful. Uh, then there is collaborative learning project, uh, lots of freely downloadable resources for groups of learners, and that promotes communication and meaningful use of language. So lots of talk here is promoted. Uh, then there is racing to English, a CD full of printable resources, quite cheap, provides EAL resources starting from those early, early stages, and then moving towards band B, C, uh, uh, um, um, and very effective for learners using EAL. Again, also promoting speaking skills before starting to write. Um, Racing to Literacy is an, uh, is a, uh, is an EAL-focused program for phonics. Again, free to download, and it includes uh, teacher notes as well. And finally, something a little bit different, uh, CLIL. CLIL stands for uh, Content and Language Integrated Learning, and it's an approach used in many other countries where uh, learners in uh, non-Anglophone countries learn uh, subjects through English. Uh, but we can actually use it for our context as well. So it's useful to, uh, to consider uh, some of these resources. So this is a resource pack, which is a book full of uh, uh, resources. And again, we'll, uh, we'll send you all of these links uh, uh, tomorrow morning, um, um, along with the recording of this webinar. So you will have those links there. Okay. Um, so uh, next, if you have TA, Consider how to support the learner or learners when they are not in withdrawal, but in mainstream lessons. Uh, so uh, how many lessons or hours can the support be offered? And uh, would the TAs need any kind of training at all? Uh, uh, communicate with pastoral team because they should be aware of any difficulties a learner faces. For example, if a learner is an asylum seeker or refugee, suffers from trauma, any need of emotional support, uh, uh, they, they, they should likely be involved. Um, and complete an initial EAL assessment. Glynis will be talking about this at length later in the webinar, so I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll let her go into uh, more detail later on that. Uh, and uh, support mainstream teachers so that they are able to support learners uh, who are new to English. In other words, provide strategies, offer resources if you can, CPD if you are able to do so. So for example, uh, you could have open doors time in the week when any teacher in the school, or maybe even any staff, could just simply visit you in your office or classroom and ask for advice. So that's one way to do that. Uh, perhaps you could uh, uh, have some informal training sessions, for example, focus on just one strategy, uh, uh, such as, for example, substitution tables or graphic organizers or translanguaging, uh, which are some of our great ideas. Or perhaps on just one, one skill, such as speaking skill, how to, uh, how to approach that. Uh, you could send a monthly one-page newsletter uh, to all staff with advice and resources. And uh, and again, uh, um, uh, going back to CPD itself, uh, uh, it's a good idea to try to get into the CPD program in your school and offer uh, CPD to the whole school. And hopefully you can do this recurrently. Uh, so it's not just a, a one-off session. Um, so, okay. Uh, and uh, now, there is also one other, uh, two more things I would like to mention in relation to this. So uh, there, is, uh, there is a wealth of resources and guidance materials on the Bell Foundation website uh, to help you support other teachers and staff. So have a look at our guidance se uh, section because there's a lot of uh, different types of guidance uh, covering different areas. Uh, and it's all downloadable and it's all free, of course. In addition, uh, the website EAL Mesh Guide is quite useful. It offers quick summaries of EAL research in different areas, such as assessments, uh, different skills, multilingualism, and many more. It's written in quite plain English, so it's easy to, uh, to engage with. Uh, and uh, so you can just go onto the page uh, dealing with an area you are interested in. 
and it has been written by some of the top experts, EAL experts in the UK uh, as well. So uh, uh, very, very good uh, resource uh, there. So um, uh, I used to be an uh, EAL coordinator uh, uh, in a secondary school in East, uh, in, in East Riding of Yorkshire for a few years. So uh, I'm going to sort of speak uh, briefly uh, uh, for just a few minutes about uh, three different uh, topics there. And so the first one is, okay, so I mentioned before, which which subjects uh, would you, if you are withdrawing learners into a class, which which subjects, you shouldn't be keeping them all the time there. So which subjects are is it beneficial to withdraw them from and which to keep them in? And so you would need to make that, make that decision. In, uh, uh, and there's no one answer to this, of course, uh, because again, uh, context determines a lot. But in my case, what happened was uh, that, I'm actually going to stop sharing so you don't have to look at the, <laughs> at the screen. Uh, in my case, what I decided was that it would be better if the learners remained in subjects, new, uh, new to English learners, which uh, in subjects which are uh, less verbally heavy. So uh, the ones where you have a lot of visual stimuli, so drama, um, arts, uh, design and technology, uh, those kinds of subjects where you can sort of see uh, visually what, uh, they're less abstract. Uh, you're, you're able to see what's going on and relate the use of language to that. But the withdrawal will happen uh, during English, science, and history lessons. And those subjects are very, very uh, heavy uh, in terms of uh, verbally heavy. So, so that's the decision, but there is no one answer to this. And it, 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 you would need to also work with your school of course, to, uh, uh, to make the decision. Uh, the other, uh, uh, the other, couple of things that I thought I'd mention is about supporting mainstream teachers. So I mentioned a couple of ideas there already. Uh, um, I did send newsletters to uh, uh, to teachers with, with strategies. They were very, very simple. One strategy, uh, uh, if I was able to find some kind of a video and link to that of, of uh, either, sometimes I, I actually uh, recorded myself, not the children necessarily, but for example, how I would model certain structures. I would, I would record myself and share this with the uh, with other teachers and then provide a link in that newsletter. So that's, uh, uh, now uh, I would also invite teachers to, to my classroom. If you feel confident uh, in your teaching that uh, you could open in during this time, uh, anyone can basically stand in the back of the classroom and, uh, and, and, and see what I do. That's a great way to share practice. So, so that's, that was another way. Uh, and open doors, I mentioned that. So uh, I have the time, uh, in my case, it was Thursday after school. It was uh, that anyone could visit me, and I would try to give them advice on how to uh, how to help help to plan that next lesson. But actually, also, if they invited me to their classroom and I was able to do that, then I would definitely go there as well. Um, and uh, uh, you know, so it went it, it worked both ways. Um, and uh, um, another idea is that you could consider starting a sort of a partnership program. In other words, a partnership teaching. That is to say uh, that uh, I used to teach with uh, an English teacher uh, for a little while in the same classroom. So there were two of us and we were teaching um, mainstream English, but I was sort of providing this sort of uh, English language support to all the learners. So therefore you, you're starting to generate a situation where EAL is not just important in that one withdrawal class, but actually it's, it's, it enriches everyone's teaching. And so, but at the same time, I'm of course learning from a, from a subject specialist, as so it could be English, could be science, could be maths, uh, but they are learning from me. So it's, uh, uh, so that can work as well, uh, quite well, if you want to sort of spread the words about the EL pedagogy. And uh, finally, because I know I have very little time, uh, <laughs> uh, um, in terms of parents, just last thing, it's useful to consider organizing an EAL dedicated parents evening. That is to say, uh, 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 because uh, the regular parents evening can be quite fast. Uh, and uh, those five minutes uh, uh, brief meetings with the teachers are just simply too, too too quick for many parents to be comfortable with. So I invited AEL parents sort of later uh, uh, later in the day for at, uh, was 90 minutes uh, meeting and it went slower. Um, provided obviously the, the, the regular things, biscuits, tea, coffee, and uh, and then I would always explain one aspect of the school to them for some very, very simple presentation. And then it was just open to questions. And I would be helping those those, those parents, but actually they also connected with one another. 
So it worked on, so, and then those networks started growing, interparental networks, if you will. That is to say, just outside, okay, uh, uh, the, the two parents who spoke the same language were able to now communicate. And then it was quite successful. And then the, the, the program grew to the point that it was actually too big. <laughs> and I started say, needing to sort of split and make more of them. So that can be quite, quite helpful. Okay, I think I should stop, unfortunately. It is very rushed, but I will uh, hand it over to Dennis now. So I'll reshare the presentation and uh, Thank you. hand it over Thank to you. Thank you, Camille. Um, and I'm going to talk now about uh, the key area of assessment and target setting and look at how the EAL coordinator can lead and plan in this area while at the same time drawing on staff and resources across the school to carry out the work. So when we're thinking about assessment, there are really three key areas that we can we need to consider. Um, where a good understanding of the learner's proficiency can lay the basis for setting, uh, drawing up targets and, and setting plans of, for support. So as we've said earlier, this is not all the sole responsibility of the EAL coordinator. That isn't really possible or feasible. So this is another area where the backing of your senior leadership team, your SLP, enrolling out assessment responsibilities across the school is really valuable and schools can benefit enormously from training all staff who teaching um, learners who are learning English as an additional language in, to conduct assessment and design support programs based on that assessment and this is really important because there needs to be regular ongoing assessment and an agreement uh, in your teams as to which learners to prioritize. So moving on to, first of all, proficiency in English and, and why that's so important. And, and this information would really, can really hopefully strengthen you in your engagements with your SLT and persuading them to invest in training for assessment for all your staff. And here it's useful to, to draw on existing research. Uh, Professor Strand and Dr. Hessel are based at the, uh, at the University of Oxford, and they've highlighted the very important link between um, proficiency in English and general academic uh, attainment. Um, and they've shown that proficiency in English is absolutely essential for that. So how do we understand th that relationship? If we look now at, at our next Thing. If we look at, at the bands, their, research, their work has shown that uh, learners who are new to English in band A or in the stages of early acquisition of English in band B will be achieving work, uh, significantly below the national average. Um, and again, this highlights why it's so important to, um, to, to, to assess each, each learner, know exactly where they are and therefore how much and what kind of support they will need. Even then looking at the third band, developing competence, we see that they will still, even as they're acquiring more English, will be below the national average. But then once we get to bands D and E, we, we, the, the work that has been done in this area shows that they will be way above the national average. So how can you go about then assessing um, uh, each learner to make sure that you've got a good foundation upon which to build support? So I want to introduce you now to the Bell Foundation's award-winning EAL assessment framework for schools, which is freely available and accessible on our web website. This framework is embedded in the curriculum and it assesses how English is used by learners in the mainstream classroom across all sub subjects. It promotes formative assessment, which then helps you plan and support learning. And so next, now we're going to move on and I'm going to show you just a little bit about how this framework is structured and what you'll find in it. So it is divided up into four domains with 10 descriptors for each domain for each band. So we'll see on the left in that sample there is, is um, uh, band A that's colored in green. So those would be the 10 descriptors that you can look at to see how, how to assess how well a learner is doing at listening. Uh, 
but all four domains are covered in the the in the in the framework listening speaking reading and viewing and writing the descriptors then can help you identify targets where so you're assessing where the learner is but also where you would want that learner to go if you look at the top of the bar of the band the list those top few descriptors are generally part of early development and as you move down the band the, it means that suggests that the learner is getting closer to the next band, but we don't expect a learner to move chronologically step by step from one to 10. These things tend to be a little bit uneven, and they also link with this idea that, that a learner could have what we call a spiky profile. So, for example, they might be a, a band B in listening, but um, uh, just a, a B and still be in band A for speaking, for example. So how does it work in terms of assessing language uh, within the curriculum? Um, so it focuses on language functions. What are the things that children need to be able to do in the different subjects? Um, so, and there might be different ways of achieving them. So for example, if, if I can show you, draw your attention there to what a typical descriptor for band D, for example, where it says, the learner can produce extended texts with an attempt to develop an argument based on logical reasoning. Now, that's obviously an important language function in a subject like science, uh, where, where, where learners need to write a report and draw conclusions. Um, so that's just an example. And so it's very much, as I say, focused on these functions rather than being weighed down in complex uh, grammatical terminology. So just broadly then to look at um, assessing each band for levels of support. So for example, for band A, um, where learners are new to English, they will need some considerable support in multiple ways in all contexts through the school day. So that'll be both using lots of visuals, for example, in classroom work, having a buddy system in place for, you know, for break times and so on. Um, that would be important at that level. Then we move to band B, where learners will still need a significant amount of support to access the curriculum and will require a clear program in all their classes. Um, but they should be using by now a little bit more English in social situations. Then in band C, Learners should be more comfortable socially and accessing more of the curriculum, but they will still need ongoing support to, to access the curriculum fully. In band D, they probably will need some su support, especially to meet the needs of specific aspects. For example, learning how to write a, a report. Um, and then finally for band E, learners at this stage will generally operate without support but it's a good idea to keep an eye out for any complex culturally bound language that they might need an explanation for. Then linked to this are our support strategies also available on the website. Um, and on this slide, these are linked to the band. So these offer very useful, um, these offer very useful strategies that you can share with the teachers in your school. Um, so they're used alongside, and once you've done your initial, your proficiency in English assessments, how then to set targets, what sort of strategies can you use to support learners to meet those targets? Um, and we give a lot of, we give a lot of um, guidance on our website and on the great ideas page that Camille referred to previously on how to use these support strategies. And I'll be telling you about courses linked to this a bit later on. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Evelina O'Donnell, who will talk to us about her work as an EAL coordinator. She's an English teacher and EAL coordinator in Thomas Elaine Academy in Stevenage, and she's also taught in Northern Ireland. She's a Bell Foundation licensed practitioner through the Chilton Teaching um, School Hub. And her school has seen some significant uh, demographic changes recently, and her school recognized the need to appoint an EAL lead. 
Um, she had to start from scratch in her school and build up systems and, and strategies. She prioritized new arrivals. Those are in the earlier bands and year sevens. Um, and so we are very, very grateful. Uh, thank you, Evelina, and over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Green. It's my pleasure. Uh, so yes, uh, my school is an academy. It's quite popular academy oversubscribed now. When I started there, there was no EAL provision in place. Um, so I had to start from scratch. Um, and when I discovered the Bell Foundation, everything kind of with your help and with the support that you have available with courses with CPD. And obviously with me becoming BFLP, everything started to take shape. And at the moment, we're still in the process of uh, fulfilling our priorities from the implementation plan, but I think we've made a very good progress over the last two years. So the most important thing, if I can share from my experience, is basically if you have SLT on your site, if you make them aware of the need of that CPD or PAL training for staff, as soon as you basically can establish that, the sooner the better. So what I ask for, I ask for twilight sessions dedicated um, uh, completely to EAL. And we have six twilight sessions in a year. And I just basically came, went to the beauty head teacher and said one should be EAL because there's no training um, provided. and with the workload that we all experience, there's no time for additional training. So now I have one every year, uh, year twilight session. When we started with comprehensible English for new arrivals, and they, we, we moved on to adaptive teaching, then we had session for classroom assistance that shaped that ethos that all members of staff understood the strategies that they can use every day with all students because those strategies very much benefit also students, um, SEN students. So they started to see the benefits of using simplified language of instructions and uh, flashcards and all of other techniques that we use. Um, and then I got members of staff interested in CPD. So I encouraged two members of staff to complete the course introduction to AL assessment. So that made my life much easier because they gather evidence and they do, they assess reading um, and writing whenever I assess listening and speaking, because I can allocate enough time now in my timetable. I negotiated two extra hours a week for EAL, which wasn't easy, it took me three years, because I'm an English teacher, obviously they don't want to uh, free any time of your timetable, but when they see the benefits of that, the students, they eventually agree. So it's kind of like, pushing through, asking, um, showing them that it works and having also parents and students on board. Also what I introduced last year, you mentioned trans language and I think there's nothing better than for those new arrivals to build up their confidence, to give them a chance of completing some of the assessments in their native language. So I just uh, translate um, essay questions, for example, for Macbeth into Polish and Russian because I can simply do it. But if there's any other language, I look for the help of other colleagues, teachers at school, and I always find somebody that would mark this. It's just for initial assessments at the start to give them this idea that they belong, that they, the school is inclusive. And then you can build up and use further resources, fantastic resources on the Bell Foundation website, differentiated for different texts, for different subjects as well. I'm only talking about English, but I know my colleagues are using many resources for science. Um, also, a good idea, Kami mentioned, is introduce Learning Village to your school. Doesn't take long to set up and helps with assessment because you can monitor students' progress very, very easily. So I have it set up for 15 students and from year seven to year 11. Um, the way I, I prioritize, I always um, prioritize obviously new arrivals are at the top of my list. And then I assess them and obviously band A and B will come first, but if I have high flyer, high achiever, and especially a student that is also taking additional GCC in year 10 or 11, then I will push them at the top of the list because we very often forget about those in C and D band because we just take it for granted a little bit. Oh, they all right, they coping okay. But those are the ones that if pushed properly can achieve this 1% of level nine GCC in the country. They usually really smart and they usually do Polish or Russian or Spanish or German in my school GCSE. 
So when you think about my school has 21% of EAL learners, but 30 languages spoken in the school. It's almost a sin not encouraging this additional GCC when some of them only have to just work on one skill. Everything else is already there. Um, Camille mentioned the newsletter in his school. I started newsletter last year and it's been EAL newsletter for staff. Best way I think of sharing information very, very quickly and sharing some strategies and kind of checking on them as well if the strategies are being used because I often ask them to send me an email or example or something um, that they're proud of or lock postcards for students in our award system. So I check on those postcards. It's very nice to see that they actually do it. Um, and also sometimes they almost like a little bit scared of the new EAL uh, student because oh, the person doesn't maybe speak English very well or they don't know the family background. So I introduced a feature uh, EAL student of the month and I give them some more kind of detail about the, the way they think, not so much about the, who they are because that's accessible, but what way they think. So I use the quote that is important for them or something that they find particularly strange living in England or something that they're proud of or their favorite dish or something funny, just to show them more like, you know, humane side of them, show them vulnerabilities, but also show their achievements, you know, to make, to make, uh, to help them also make friends, you know, things like that. So, um, and I think CPD or staff, um, promote that CPD, promote webinars that are available on the Bell, through the Bell Foundation. Like at the moment, I have three new members of staff asking me really interested in um, developing their career in EAL and building up that little team around you. I started with one person, one classroom assistant. Now I have two teachers that completed different training through the Bell Foundation and they really, really helpful. And it, it's getting to the point now that the head teacher himself recognizes the fact that he should give them some time in the timetable. But it's very, it's a process of, um, it takes about three years. I would very much uh, recommend the need assessment if you could contact uh, the foundation, ask for, for the need assessment, because then you will be able to get this implementation plan written for you, very specific, very unique for your school, because every school is different and has different needs. And my school is very lucky in a way that SLT is very friendly, very supportive, very approachable. But I know that that's not the case in every school. And maybe in that sense, I had it a little bit easier and also helps that my one of the members of SLT is head of English. So it's my line manager. So it was a little bit easier for me to come to her. Uh, she also has step of qualifications, so she understands, she knows where I'm coming from. So in that sense, I was lucky. But you never know, I probably wouldn't know she has step of qualification, just came up in a conversation. So sometimes starting those conversations as well with people and, and showing who is enthusiastic and you, if you get a trainee, I know that there is a lot of complaints about the lack of EA training um, in teaching courses. So we got two trainees. When I mentioned courses to them, they were so enthusiastic to do them, just getting people on board. And I think it then grows itself. It's like a, it's just like a system, you know, that, that develops itself once you get the, the ball rolling, as long as you keep it very positive and be very weary of whatever you spend to staff and whatever you present to staff, never make it sound like additional work, always make it sound like you're supporting and helping them. Because you do, and you're still asking for additional work, but hide it nicely. <laughs> That's just from my experience. So you have to be very diplomatic, and then you, people do it. Because people, people like feeling um, that they're making a positive change, so give them tools and strategies that they can easy wins. I, I always call it in my uh, newsletter, here are some easy wins for this month for you that will make changes in your classroom, will make your life easier. And then I get loads of emails back, oh yeah, it worked with this one. He didn't do anything in my lessons and now he's doing it. So it's kind of, you know, and then slowly, slowly, you will introduce more strategies that are maybe more difficult and they will have to, they will require a bit of, learning from teachers, but they will be more eager than to try them on. Um, uh, <clears throat> the flashcards are very good, like to start with, and you can use the Bell Foundation to create them, or you can use the learning um, 
Vrach, and they, they're very easy to make, and everybody can use a flashcard. So if you if you really start in the provision, at least school maybe start from that. I don't know if there's anything else that you would like for me. Thank to you, share. thank you, um, Evelina, so much for that. It's so useful to hear to hear from you. I wanted to pick up on just two things: the importance, as you said, of training other staff, but also, as you said, how that opens up another career path for somebody. Um, so that's really interesting. And the point you made about using translanguaging in assessment as well, making that part of it so that one gets a better sense of, of what learners can do. So thank you so much. I think that's incredibly valuable um, and all the very best to you in your work. Thank um, you. I'm going to just race on, unfortunately, so that uh, we can finish, um, but thank you very much. So the second area then um, that we're going to look at in terms of, of assessment is assessing curriculum knowledge. Um, in other words, uh, finding out what in their previous schooling uh, a learner might, might have, have already learned. And just to, to then explain um, how you would go about that or rather what not, what not to do. So for example, um, we would say, um, Prior to avoid using assessments that are designed for first language uh, speakers. Um, there are a number of reasons why not. Uh, often those, those assessments have complex grammar and vocabulary. There are lots of cultural references that might be foreign. Um, there are task types that children might not have, have known about doing um, in their previous education system and finally there could be unknown words meanings of words so in fact you'll be you won't be assessing what you think you're assessing so just to move on and to uh, further to avoid tasks which require a lengthy verbal response because again then what you're testing is english proficiency rather than their knowledge of a particular topic rather um use things like recognition tasks where you can use a visual and a, a, a learner could point to things as just as um, Evelina was suggesting let them use the, the language they know you can also use matching strategies or sequencing graphic organizers and so on as a way of assessing what the learner already know and then lastly to assess um, their first language, or, you know, what, what literacy they may already uh, have covered in their first language and so on. And the better picture you get about in this area, the better you will then be able to know how to draw on the resources that your that learners already have as part of their, their learning of English and, and English in English. And how would you go about doing that? Um, here you would draw on uh, information gathered from families, perhaps reports, documents from prior uh, previous schools, and if if that, and then drawing on professional interpreters to help you um, understand what that's all about. So the last little section then uh, is we've talked about whole school training. This has come up through our webinar today. How important it is. To, to arrange training for all of your staff, to help you to, to lessen your loads and be that um, for learning or pastoral care. And so what would the benefits be? First of all, to help take the load off you so that that load is, is spread across the school. Secondly, it helps to, going back to one of our key uh, principles, it develops an understanding of and an investment in an inclusive, a pedagogy and it then enables you to reach both teaching and support staff in other words everyone who has to deal with with um, the specific learner so we spoke then so to talk about how can you go about an access training we've been speaking a lot about bell foundation licensed practitioners and these are people based in different areas around the country who are trained and licensed by us to run our courses in their area. And the advantage of accessing these is that they can then, close to you, is that they then specifically designed for the conditions in your area. And we've just developed new partnerships in Bristol, in Coventry, in Bedfordshire, and in Buckinghamshire. 
Um, so then to look at additional training that you can access, we've spoken throughout the webinar about different courses that are running. For example, these are, are two courses that will be coming up, one at the end of February and one in, in March. Um, uh, I, we could, you could try and encourage your senior leadership team to arrange a, a subscription to the NALDIC publication EAL Journal. And then for networking, NALDIC is the, is the National English Additional Language uh, Subject Organization, and they have these RIGs, Regional Information Groups. So you could try and see if there's one in your area where you can network with other professionals like yourself. And of course, also looking on social media um, for groups on Twitter and Facebook, where there are forums for sharing ideas. Um, next, then, if we, you could, we can also talk about, as Evelina's mentioned, sharing your knowledge and running staff, uh, running training yourself for your staff um, on assessment, for example. Um, secondly, we've talked about the ideas on our great ideas page you could encourage a teacher to try out one of those and then report back to a group of teachers on how it went and how it worked um, and to mention two courses that are coming other courses that are will be running shortly understanding language for learning in multilingual schools will be happening in april and a course called supporting new arrivals who are new to english will be running in may and then finally i'm just pleased to announce that we've got uh, a we'll be launching very soon a, an action framework uh, with recommendations for schools for sustainable provision for children who are refugees. And lastly, we'll soon be launching a call for schools or organizations that might be um, interested in contributing to our regional pro uh, provision to, to becoming involved in the Centers for Expertise. Um, Again, sign up for our newsletter that will give you announcements, it will tell you what's happening and watch out on, on social media for videos providing more detail about, uh, about that particular offer. So it just remains for me to say thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, and back to Sheila. Yeah, thank you from me as well. Thank you for listening. And hopefully you found it uh, useful to you. Absolutely. Well, it's been very informative, a lot of information that you have provided quickly in the last hour, but um, it sounds like a lot of participants are thanking you as well. And thank you very much for your, for your um, presentation today.